we are ready for our next speaker, Sharp Pedro de Magellas, who is uh, our last Zoom speaker. Pedro, are you there? Well, hi, Martin. Hey, can yes, you? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. We can hear you, and we can now see you. Oh, all right, fantastic. <laughs> so I'll share my screen, and so. while I'll do that, I'll thank you very much, Martin, for the invitation and. Uh, can you see my slides? It's perfect. We are ready whenever awesome. you are. <laughs> thank you. I'll, I'll set up a timer so I don't hopefully go overboard. And uh, and yeah, so thank you, Morton, for the invitation. And thank you, and, and, and Alex, Daniela, everyone, for uh, another fantastic conference. Uh, really very exciting um, talks and science uh, again. So, and I, I, I just feel sorry I can't be in Copenhagen this time. I'm relocating from Liverpool to Birmingham so it's 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 I'm actually in my parents house at the moment my house my office everything is just boxes at the moment so so let me tell you a, a little bit of uh, what we've been doing so for, first of all actually um, you know I think this is the third uh, talk I give in a ARDD and it's always very um, uh, exciting and very uh, great science and so actually for the the last talk I, I gave which was in 2020 um, so based on the talk uh, I then published a, a small perspective on uh, longevity pharmacology based on some of the, the results and uh, ideas that I discussed in the conference. So, so hopefully <laughs> from this uh, um, conference there will be some similar outputs. And actually, the I guess one of the things I showed already two years ago, but I think it's still timely to show again, is that we're seeing this big increase in longevity drugs. So it's actually, um, so this is number of drugs we have in our drug age database per year, per year of publication. Um, and as you can see, there's, um, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of linear, but then in recent years is exponential. So you have this exponential increase in the number of longevity drugs that, you know, we as a field are, are discovering, which is quite exciting and that we see even today. So, um, so if you look at, for example, so uh, I, Brian actually mentioned our drug age database of aging related drugs. And uh, in the current data version of the database, which I think we released earlier this year, um, there's over um, 1,000 drugs and compounds associated with aging or longevity in model organisms. So, so again, that's that's quite remarkable. So that's uh, I think two years ago, I think it was a little over five hundred, and now it's over a thousand. So again, we we still see this exponential increase in longevity drugs and compounds, which I think is quite um, remarkable. Now, of course, this is across different organisms, and of course, um, you know, you, you you have you know some drugs that are studied only once, and other drugs that are studied more than once. So, so actually, with uh, with Alex Moskalev and a few others uh, earlier this year, we 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 did this sort of meta analysis or, or statistical analysis of some of the drugs uh, in our databases. So, so if you look at the the drugs with the most studies, probably not surprising, the the top two are resveratrol and rapamycin, which of course are been studied for several years in the context of longevity. So, but again, you you see this uneven distribution with some molecules only studied once in the context of longevity and others with multiple dozens of studies like resveratrol and rapamycin. Now what is interesting as well is if you look at the specific effect sizes, um, this is across model systems, um, in, uh, in some of the, the most studied drugs you actually see a lot of variability, which I thought was interesting. So if you look at uh, resveratrol, um, you know, there are studies that show an increase in lifespan from resveratrol, some that show a decrease in lifespan. And actually, if you look at the average, now, and I know, I mean, this is quite of a quick analysis, you know, it, it combines different organisms. Uh, but if you do a, a quick analysis, actually, the average uh, lifespan, when you look at all of the studies combined, is about zero or slightly of a zero for resveratrol. For rapamycin, however, the results, I think, are more... Uh, indicative of, if, of, of an effect in the sense that it shows a high, I think it, of all of the drugs we looked at, it shows um, a greater average lifespan effect that you see across different studies. Of course, you know, again, this is different model models, this is mouse data, this is C. elegans, it's a combination. Um, so you, you, can, you can do more detailed analysis. But I thought it was interesting on one hand to show all this diversity 
in, uh, in effect sizes um, and to see a, a stronger effect for a longevity um, effect from rapamycin than, for example, for resveratrol and, and other compounds. So, and I mean, this, so this is something we published, as I said, with Alexei Moskavla, uh, who is at the conference uh, earlier this year. Now, the other thing that our lab does quite a lot is we do a lot of computational um, machine learning bioinformatics methods development from network analysis to machine learning, deep learning, to prioritize candidates, uh, to prioritize candidate targets, to prioritize genes, but also to prioritize drugs. So I, I just wanted to touch upon some of the work we've done on the pharmacology side uh, in terms of applying computational tools um, and some of the follow-up we've done in, in recent times, while well, some of it is published, other is not. So, so some years back already, we, we did this machine learning method for predicting life-extending compounds in C. elegans. We did another second study, which I actually mentioned already in our ARDD, so I won't go into details, but basically it's a network pharmacology approach where we take gene expression signatures of longevity, um, mostly caloric restriction, and then we look for drugs that induce a similar profile. And we tested this a few years back, we published this, uh, of the five drugs we tested, four of them extended lifespan in worms. Okay, so, so our method can allow us to prioritize and identify compounds that extend lifespan. So, now one of the most novel compounds we discovered was allantoin. Now, allantoin is, is, is a marker of oxidative stress. Um, so we were interested in trying to understand its mechanisms. Now, um, one possibility is that there's a hormetic effect, right? It's a stress, mild stress that extends lifespan. The other possibility uh, and that's, is that it works by a specific receptor. Now, allantoin has, has some problems in terms of oral administration in, in mammals. So we decided to focus on a different compound called remenidin. Um, and that, that's, you know, so this is now in bioarchives, so it's not been published yet, but it's, well, it's available if you're looking at more information. But basically, um, remenidin targets a particular kind of imidazolin receptor, a type 1 receptor to be more specific, uh, which is what we think happens with allantoin as well. Although I have to say we focus more on remenidin because we thought it'd be more interesting. Um, why we think it'd be more interesting to focus on remenidin? Well, first of all, it's an oral drug. So it's an antihypertensive drug. So it's, it can be given in the long term to elderly patients. Um, it does have side effects, but it tend to be rare and not particularly severe. So it does, you know, it does fit the, the criteria for a potential geroprotector of, of wider applications than Elantwin, which, which in terms of administration to humans is more complicated. So, so we focus on real menadine. Um, now, the first thing we did, of course, is we look at lifespan. So we tested for lifespan effects in real menadine in worms, which you start to see here. So uh, these are different dosages. Um, so we see here controls in black, and then you see a dosage-dependent effect up until about 200 micromolar, um, and then it starts to decrease, and then 400 micromolar, it doesn't extend lifespan anymore, or, or very little. So at about 200 micromolar, it extends lifespan. Um, it also extends lifespan if you administer the drug late in life. So, so normally when you do a, a drug test in worms, you administer it in young animals, uh, normally throughout their lifespans. Um, but if you administer it later in life, at day 12, it also extends lifespan, which is interesting, again, because we want drugs that are administered in at least middle-age um, individuals. So, I mean, we did various other analyses, which I'll, I'll, I won't go into detail, um, but, I mean, we showed that there's no synergy between realmenidine and caloric restriction, or with rapamycin, which was to see here. So this is data from it 2 mutants, which is a genetic model of caloric restriction, uh, which extends lifespan, but when you administer real menadin to it to munits, uh, it doesn't extend lifespan further. And the same thing, thing you'll see with rapamycin, so rapamycin extends lifespan in worms, um, but when you administer real menadin, it doesn't expand, extend lifespan further. So there's no synergistic effects with caloric restriction or with rapamycin. Then in terms of the mechanism, um, we think that um, it's not just a normatic effect. We think realmenidine works by a, um, a new, well, so in mammals, realmenidine uh, is thought to, to work via a particular kind of type 1 imidazolin receptor. Um, previously, it wasn't known that worms had these receptors. We did some 
sequence analysis and homology search and, and bioinformatics. And we identify a particular gene, which we, we term niche one, uh, which we think is the new nishkarin, which is a new type of type one imidazolin receptor in worms. Um, and then what we did was also we, 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 we made some knockouts and when you, you, you disrupt the action of niscarine in worms, romanidin no longer extends lifespan. So we think that romanidin works extends lifespan in worms via a, a particular kind of uh, receptor. Um, it's a new type of receptor in worms, but there's a homologue that's known already in humans and mice, uh, which is called niscarine. Um, we think it also works via autophagy, a regulation of autophagy. I mean, I'm not going to show you the data here today, but I mean, it is in the, the bioarchive uh, preprint. Um, so that, that's, that's how we think it works. We did, well, this was a, a lot of work from uh, Dominic Bennett, which was a PC student in our lab. Um, so, so it does point towards autophagy as the mechanism of action via this particular kind of receptor. Then, so this was also a collaboration with uh, Colin Ewald at, in Zurich and uh, Vadim Gladyshev in Harvard. Um, so Vadim also looked at um, gene expression profiles uh, in mice of rilmenidine and compared them to other life-extending interventions like caloric restriction. Um, and he showed that there's a similar or there's an overlapping transcriptional changes in mice, um, I believe in kidney and liver, if I remember correctly. Um, there's uh, overlapping transcriptional changes induced by real manadin, um that you see in other life-extending interventions as well. So, uh, I mean, I, sh I should say for those not familiar, so there is some work already in real manadin in mice, in neurodegenerative diseases. Um, so, so, for example, David Rubenstein in, in Cambridge has done some work of real manadin having benefits in some mouse models of neurodegenerative diseases. So there is some work already in terms of potential applications in other diseases in addition to hypertension. Um, so it, it is something that I think is quite exciting in terms of having this drug that's already used for humans, um, that's relatively safe, it can be used in elderly patients uh, in the long term, um, and that it could be potentially repurposed for other indications like neurodegenerative diseases uh, and others. So, so we're looking actually to, to uh, I mean, ideally I would love to do um, an aging study in mice, or a lifespan study in mice, uh, which hasn't been done yet. So that's one of the things that, that I would like to do and uh, explore other potential applications. So if anyone's interested, feel free to, to drop me an, an email because I think it's quite an exciting uh, potential new uh, gyro protector. So, so the, the last thing I'll, I'll touch upon is something um, that we've heard a bit about from this conference, something we've been playing with a little bit. Um, so we've heard about cellular um, reprogramming and uh, epigenetic rejuvenation, which you can achieve with Yamanaka factors. Um, you can also achieve with partial reprogramming. Um, you know, as, as Alejandro Campo um, showed and, and many others have shown. Um, so I think that's, that's a fascinating topic as well. We'll be trying to do a little bit of work on it. I mean, um, this is a review we published with Alexandro recently. So basically what we've been trying to do in our lab is trying to apply some of our computational methods um, to partial reprogramming and to reprogramming, um, including network pharmacology and machine learning, uh, deep learning approaches to essentially try to predict compounds that induce cellular rejuvenation. So, so that's something we've, we're trying to do now. Um, we have some results. I don't have any results to show yet. Um, but given that it is possible to, to test compounds for cellular rejuvenation in, in vitro models, I think it's, it's quite a, you know, it gives a lot of options in terms of how you progress with it because you, you can, you have a, a clear path to, uh, to test experimentally your computational predictions. So, so it's something that we're quite interesting in, in, uh, progressing as well. So, and again, if anyone's interested in collaborating, please feel free to, to get in touch. Um, I mean, as a side note, and also a kind of a disclaimer, um, I, I'm also CSO of a company called Youth Bio uh, Therapeutics, which is focused on partial reprogramming. Um, so, but our goal in the company, so what I've shown, so this is work from, from the lab. Um, in the company, the focus is more on developing gene therapies. Um, employing partial reprogramming to uh, restore youthful profiles in, in, in tissues. So, so that, that's, that's what we're trying to do, but that's, I think that's an important disclaimer as well. And uh, I mean, that, that's something else we're doing uh, or I'm doing, but more at um, gene 
therapy level, trying to, to develop gene therapies. But I'm also interested in a pharmacological approach um, because, as I said, that's quite an easy one to, to test also experimentally, at, at least in in vitro models, of course. Um, so, so with that, I, um, I told you that it's quite remarkable that our drug age database keeps growing at an exponential pace. I mean, we have, um, oops, I think that's out of date, actually. That's, uh, that's from two years ago. It's not, it's now over a thousand longevity drugs. I mean, that, that's what happens when you, you don't update your slides in two years. It just, you know, the amount of data is just exploding. Um, so we, we know over a thousand, um, longevity drugs uh, across model systems, of course. Um, I do think it's important to, to mention that there's substantial variation in effect sizes, um, and there's also some potential biases, not just in our database, but as scientists, you know, tending to publish positive results more than they publish negative results, which I, well, subject for a different uh, talk, but I, I think it's a, it's a problem as well. But there is variation, as I showed for resveratrol, as I showed for rapamycin. I mean, as a side note, I, I should say that we've had, I mean, we've tested rapamycin in longevity effects in worms uh, multiple times, and even just our lab alone, you know, there is variation. It, it extends lifespan, but sometimes you do experiments where it doesn't extend as much or even doesn't extend lifespan at all. So, you know, there is variation even within one single lab in terms of the effect sizes you see for some of these drugs. So I, I think that's one of the reasons, actually, I think it's very important to have databases and to do this sort of meta-analysis that uh, condense all of the information and all of the data um, uh, into to one single paper or, or, or source. Now, I've told you about our network and machine learning methods to predict new targets and, and new drugs, which I think is quite, um, well, we applied a lot to genes, but it can apply to drugs as well. And that really led us down this rabbit hole of first the land to win, and then Vilmanidin, which, uh, which we now show that it's a new share protector, which we think we works via um, a particular receptor called Nishkarin, which we identified in worms, a homologue of the mammalian uh, receptor, uh, and we think it also works via probability of autophagy. Uh, and lastly, I told you about cellular rejuvenation compounds, something we're, we're trying to predict in, in silico using various computational methods, um, which is still ongoing, but I think it's another interesting and, and exciting avenue of research. I'm happy to, to collaborate on that, or we'll manage, well, anything really, <laughs> happy to, to collaborate. So, so with that, um, I just want to, uh, finished by, I mean, I started by saying that I'm in the process of moving from Liverpool to, to Birmingham, so this is actually my new workspace. My office is around here. Uh, so this is the hospital in, um, Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham. Um, and so, so, so this is my um, new lab website and also email address. And um, as always, if you have any suggestions or um, opportunities for, for working together or collaborating, please feel free to, to get in touch. And thank you for your time and attention. Thank you so much, uh, Pedro. Uh, do we have any questions here? In the There's one from Rafa. Ciao, it's nice to see you. Have you tried to do um, an evaluation of the compounds, not just for longevity, for any other aging-linked phenotypes to see how those pan out? So, so we have done a little bit of work on health span as well, which I didn't mention. So for Romanidin, for instance, and the Lantuin, we did some metrics of health span in worms, uh, you know, movement, um, how much food they eat, which declines with age, but you, you don't see it as much when you feed the compounds. So I guess we have done it a little bit for some of the compounds we 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 studied. Uh, we haven't done it in terms like for, for the database in terms of, of compiling all of that data. I think that would be very interesting, but it would require quite a bit more uh, pairs of hands to do that sort of large-scale curation. So, so yes, partially we've done it for the compounds we've studied, uh, but I think it could be done on a broader scale. More questions? i got a question. Okay. We have a question. Um, nice talk. Did you, you, you mentioned that I'm glad you mentioned the problem with um, a bias towards positive results, so people don't publish negative results. There may be a way that you could work that out without seeing that, because if a compound has been around for a long time, and yet there's not many publications, and I think we mentioned rapamycin, for example, in C. elegans, that's been around for like 20 years, and there's only been two or three publications showing that it um, extends lifespan, and they don't have the same 
always have the same concentration, like agree in concentration. So then you can use that kind of data to work out whether there's a chance of there being negative results. Like how long has it been around? How, how, how many people may have used it? And something like that as some sort of like computational way to work out if it's likely to be a solid, solid result. So that, that, that's a very good question, actually, and, and something we have played with a little bit, not, not for compounds, but for genetic data, because there's, there's a lot of genetic data, or more genetic data, I would say. Um, so we have tried to do that a little bit for genetic data. Um, you could probably do a similar kind of analysis. There are methods to identify um, scientific systematic biases uh, which have been applied for, for other fields that we could do in the field of aging. I, I think it's, I, I, I guess the, the, there's a couple of problems with it. Um, one of them is that the data is quite noisy and, and to demonstrate that it's really biased, I think you need to, to have pretty strong evidence uh, and not just, you know, some, some sort of uh, hand waving and, and which you do see sometimes. Um, the, the other issue, I guess, is that it's more, how can I put it? I mean, I, I don't see a grant being funding doing that kind of stuff. Let, let's put it that way. You know, grant funders don't want you to check biases. They want you to check uh, <laughs> new stuff. They take, it needs to be excited. I mean, they don't even want you to validate stuff that's known already, uh, which is a problem with science, which probably a subject for a different, um, a different day. I mean, likewise, PhD students, they want to do something excited. They want to discover something new. They don't want to go and check, you know, has there been some biases in researchers in the past? So I think that's, that's one of the limitations as well, which is that, you know, it, it's, it's a kind of analysis that can be done, but it's probably quite difficult to get funded and also difficult to, to find motivated students or, or postdocs or bioinformaticians to do it. Right. Uh, I would say that's, that's oh, it's actually, actually, just one more thing I forgot, Morten. Um, so we do actually have positions. We have uh, some, some positions for postdocs and, and bioinformaticians in our lab. So if you're interested in anything we do, please feel free to get in touch. That sounds super exciting. Thank you so much, Pedro. Really great talk. Thank you. <laughs>